Good morning, and um, can I begin by saying what a great pleasure it is to, to be uh, here in Tashkent. I've uh, had the pleasure of visiting Uzbekistan on quite a few occasions over the past few years, and it's always a, a great joy. Um, the Uzbek hospitality is uh, unparalleled. We're always made to feel extremely welcome when we visit. And um, uh, I'm sure this occasion will uh, not be an exception to, to that experience that I've had um, in this country so far. Um, thank you also to Nicola and Jim for uh, creating such a rich framework for our discussions, for um, setting out um, many of the key issues in research into English uh, medium instruction. Um, I think that was uh, um, the, the best possible um, opening for um, the debates and discussions and experience sharing, which we will um, enjoy over the coming days. Um, um, as uh, Maxine um, said in her introduction, I'm going to um, take a very different approach to, uh, to Nicola and Jim. So I'm going to bring us right into a specific case study, um, a specific um, institution um, where not only English medium instruction has been in place for a number of years, um, but uh, a whole English medium um, environment um, is, to be, is to be found um, with students buy into when they enter that institution. Um, so um, we are then um, coming right to the, the heart of the matter and seeking to uh, respond to uh, what Nicola and Jim called for in their, in their last slide there um, for further research into the um, implementation of, of, of EMI. Well, I'm going to be taking this to a, a project that I've been leading for the past couple of years, uh, really looking in detail at the experience of both staff and students um, where English medium provision um, has indeed been implemented. Um, and I'm also going to be uh, explaining um, how we have sought to be very clear about the, the policy that lies behind um, this, uh, this, this case. So uh, very neatly, um, and you would almost think that Nicola, Jim and I have um, worked seamlessly and tirelessly together to ensure that uh, uh, what they set up led into my presentation. Well, if you'd like to believe that, I'll, I'll let you believe that. Um, so that is then um, uh, how I'm going to be moving forward from the previous uh, uh, presentation um, and the, uh, the approach I'm going to be taking. But also looking, uh, looking backwards also at um, uh, previous work on English medium environments. Um, Nicola and Jim have already quoted fairly fully the work of Ernesto uh, Macro and his, and his colleagues. And indeed, um, if you're not familiar with their work, then I really suggest you, uh, you seek to, uh, to um, put that right. Um, Ernesto um, produced a book last year um, called English Medium Instruction, which is a, a brilliant summary of, um, of re all the scholarship in this area presented in a very readable way, and I think should be compulsory reading for um, anybody interested in the theory of or the practical implementation of uh, English medium uh, instruction. Um, in um, an, an article that Ernesto and his colleagues um, wrote, um, looking at the, the state of the art in research into English medium instruction, um, they noted that um, this is a, a relatively new area of, of investigation. While English medium instruction in one shape or form may have been adopted in countries around the world for some time, um, the serious kind of scholarly interest in what's been going on, the impact it's been having on staff and students and the practical challenges involved in, uh, in those environments is a, is a pretty new area of study dating back only uh, around 20 years. Um, and the research that's been done to date um, has amounted to or had amounted when um, uh, Macaro and his colleagues looked at the state of the art uh, around 280 uh, studies uh, that have been carried out, 102 on the higher education environment, uh, 40 
on Asian contexts for English medium instruction, um, but none on Central Asia. So we're sitting in a, a part of the world where there's a, a strong ambition for more English medium instruction, uh, but at least until um, I began to uh, do the work that I've been doing with, uh, with colleagues um, here in Uzbekistan, it seems as though there hadn't been any analyses of the experience of, uh, of being taught through English or teaching in English in, in this, uh, this region. Um, and indeed, Jennifer Jenkins, who is one of the uh, leading uh, researchers into um, English as a lingua franca, um, has taken a strong interest in um, English as a lingua franca in higher education. Um, and she has noted that to date there's actually been little research exploring the lived experiences and views of international students, let alone any in-depth research on the subject. So universities have been very happy to attract more students from overseas without taking responsibility for really understanding what it means to operate through uh, the medium of a language that isn't your, your, your own. Um, and of course, for international students, it's not just what goes on in the classroom, uh, it's how they manage in society more generally. Um, I was hearing about a, a case study of, um, of Chinese students arriving um, in, I think it was Glasgow, I'm afraid I heard about this in a conference and didn't note down the, the reference, um, but believing that they were well, well prepared for life in the UK, uh, but of course when they went to do their shopping for the first time, uh, the, uh, the, the interaction was so dispiriting because the, the, the accent, and indeed to some extent the dialect, was entirely incomprehensible to them that they preferred just to revert to their, uh, their own Chinese speaking social sphere. So uh, universities have a, a, a responsibility, an ethical responsibility for providing support which goes uh, beyond just the, uh, the practical issues of learning through the medium um, of English. So uh, the context that I'm going to be talking about um, is, uh, is that of Westminster International University in Tashkent and there are a number of colleagues from that uh, excellent institution here in the room who will be able to talk more uh, to you um, as the, the days go on about uh, the, the challenges, the successes, uh, the reality of, um, of, of operating in that English medium uh, environment. Uh, Westminster University in Tashkent was founded 17 years ago. Um, it's not, as some people have suggested to me, a branch campus of the University of Westminster in London. Um, it is an, an independent Uzbek institution uh, founded under Uzbek uh, legislation, but in partnership with the University of Westminster, which provides uh, validation for the, the courses um, and um, a um, supportive uh, relationship um, to allow uh, colleagues in in Tashkent to learn from the experience of UK higher education, both in terms of quality assured teaching and learning, and also increasingly uh, through research. So um, it was founded initially with a, a handful of, of students, um, around 100, and has grown very rapidly. Um, it is a prestigious university in the region, even in the uh, relatively few hours I've been in Uzbekistan uh, now, a number of colleagues have said what marvellous things they've heard about Westminster International University um, in Tashkent, how highly regarded it is, how excellent its students and graduates are, um, some of whom are, are working with us and, 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 and uh, guiding us today. Um, so it's a, a beacon of high quality, quality assured uh, teaching and increasing of research in the region. Um, students are on business, economics and, and law programs, as many of you will know who are familiar with uh, the higher education context, um, the, the disciplines are divided between institutions and the, the policy, the language policy of, um, of Westminster, um, which um, until recently didn't really kind of exist as a formal language policy and indeed may not uh, exist as a formal language policy into the future, although we've been very much trying to, um, to work on that. The, the, the policy is a de facto one, which means it's not a formal legislation, a formally agreed state statement of language practices on campus is rather um, something that operates through, through agreement um, and that is that uh, the entire institution is, is an English only uh, one. 
So um, one of the very first things I did when I started to work at Westminster in London back in 2016 was to come to Tashkent. Um, having moved from the north of England to London, um, my life had become you know, exciting enough, really, uh, moving to the big city. Uh, but, you know, how much more exciting could it become? Well, a lot more exciting as I was whisked off to, to Central Asia uh, to, to visit our partner institution here. Um, and um, in conversation with uh, senior colleagues, um, it was clear that the reality of uh, using English was rather more complicated than the, the de facto expectation that it would simply be an English institution uh, suggested. Um, it was explained to me that some of the expectations of students were, were problematic, the extent to which only English should be used in the classroom or whether it was appropriate to uh, use Uzbek or Russian to explain particular challenges, the extent to which English should be used outside Outside the classroom or whether it was acceptable for interaction to happen um, in the medium of other languages um, was um, you know, a, a, a problematic issue. There were differences in understanding and expectation uh, which could lead to, to disagreement and uh, in some cases to, to disappointment. So um, I was asked, given my own background in uh, language planning and language policy, albeit in, in the Nordic countries primarily, if I could you know, help resolve some of these, uh, these practical challenges. And I think that's the first point to make, really, that you can't um, introduce English, you can't simply determine that an institution will become English medium without being ready for there to be disagreements, mismatches, and expectation about what that means, uh, means in practice. So rather than simply um, proposing um, a policy to manage the situation um, as a kind of sociolinguist um, who likes to kind of do things in detail, um, I was keen that any policy we introduced was in the words of uh, Franz uh, Gregerson and his colleagues in, in uh, Scandinavia, the result of wide-ranging debate conducted at all levels in involving all groups affected. So we then um, embarked on such a, a survey um, and sought to understand the views of, of all students, of academic staff, of administrative staff, of maintenance staff, all of whom are stakeholders in um, an English medium environment. Um, and as I'm going to explain to you over the next few minutes, uh, we uh, carried out a, a questionnaire survey of their experiences and carried out interviews in order to establish um, what Nicola was talking about at the end of, of her presentation, namely a clear set of policy guidelines Lines so that all involved could understand what languages should be used, why English was being utilised, um, and generally kind of manage the, uh, the complexities of the situation. Um, I was lucky to work with two uh, research assistants at Westminster in, in Tashkent, whose names uh, appeared on the, um, the opening slide, um, and um, we had a... Uh, very interesting time and made some very interesting findings, which I will um, explain in a moment. Um, having done that work on um, a potential language policy for this English medium environment, um, we've been able to, to go further. So uh, my two uh, Tashkent-based colleagues were sent off into uh, the more remote corners of Central Asia um, and did work in uh, universities in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, um, working with staff and students who are operating through the medium of English to understand uh, their uh, challenges and experiences. Um, and and I'm developing another project now, which, if it gets the funding that we've uh, applied for, will look at the needs of the business community in Uzbekistan to understand um, um, what it means for those working in international business, and particularly in the tourism industry, which is the, the major growth sector in the country, which demands more and more people to operate through English, and we need to understand you know, what that is really like for the people involved. So, um, looking at the, the higher education environment here, um, it's clear that there are um, um, some mismatches between the ambitions and the realities um, uh, encountered. Uh, so, a student in Kyrgyzstan um, told um, my, my colleagues that English will become more important because it gives access to plenty of resources and opens doors to employment opportunities, a view um, often expressed by the students that we've spoken to. Um, and that's a 
certainly in line with the, the presidential decree from 2012, which massively accelerated the provision of English in schools in Uzbekistan, uh, requiring English to be taught from the first year of schooling, which is a, you know, a major policy initiative with very significant uh, practical um, um, outcomes. However, um, teachers in universities um, here um, have a rather more um, depressing, I suppose, experience of um, their ability to implement um, English medium instruction. A teacher at a state university told us, in order to be accepted to university, students should have B1. However, students come with A1 in other faculties such as biology, chemistry and others, and this causes problems with teaching materials. That's a rather sort of uh, diplomatic way of expressing a pretty frustrating reality. The teacher must be very professional to deal with, uh, with such uh, realities. So the, the questions that we were interested in to try to get under the, under the hood, to get you know, below the surface of, um, of you know, what it's like to, uh, to, to, to live in an English medium environment here um, were, were these, which languages are used in practice um, uh, and in what contexts, what language support the staff and students receive and what more would they like. It's an important question because universities can't think that this is a resource-free endeavour um, there need to be proper um, programs, proper continuing professional development, proper um, student support mechanisms in place if this is going to work. Um, how well do people believe they speak, write and read, understand English and do they think that their English skills are sufficient for their needs? An important question for any institution to, to really understand. Um, how well do, do they perceive that others use English? And it's, it's all about perceptions. And it's all about having confidence in uh, their own skills, their own sense of their employability, their own sense that their English will or will not work in particular contexts, um, and their own confidence in, in others, in their teachers, um, uh, to, uh, to do the work they need to do. Um, how much English do they think should be used um, with regard to other languages? So how blended should classrooms be um, and uh, the wider environment um, as well? And also an interesting question for a sociolinguist, what are the attitudes towards varieties of English? Is Uzbek English seen as an acceptable variety of English, as something that should be aspired to, or is there still a, a, a desire, a kind of belief that British or US English can be can be mastered. So by answering these questions, we hope that we could live up to um, Andy Kirkpatrick's expectation around language policy making for higher education, that actual practice should inform language policy, and we should have a coherent policy for which all stakeholders have been consulted. Um, and we're also responding to uh, a call that uh, Nicola and her colleagues uh, expressed in an earlier publication um, that we have a clear rationale for why we're doing English medium instruction um, and a clear statement of the policy in our institution on the use of languages. So, moving on then, um, we had a very positive response to our questionnaire survey, um, over a thousand responses, which is in a fantastic body of, of, of data on the experience of operating through English here. The majority, majority were students, but also you know, good responses from all other categories of staff in the institution. Um, we had a prize contest, so if people were willing to include their names, then they were entered into a, a, a prize draw to win a tablet, and that focused the, not a, not a sleeping pill, you understand, but you know, a, 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 a per, small person computer and of course that was um, you know an incentive um, for a valuable incentive to get people involved um, we discovered that um, one of the strengths of Westminster is that it is a highly multilingual language ecology um, that um, from my perspective one of the great strengths is the fact that so many languages are in use so many cultures are reflected in the languages and that is something that should be capitalised on and celebrated. Um, I think there's only one native English speaker um, in um, Westminster here in, in, in Tashkent, um, but 14 other languages are spoken as first languages across campus. Um, 
there's a, a kind of a majority of Uzbek speakers, but there's a slightly greater number of first language Russian speakers than in society more generally, um, as Russian still remains a prestige language, a language of, uh, of education and, and culture. Um, so it's a rich language ecology, and I would say that's an important message to all institutions in this part of the world. Don't get obsessed by English everywhere. The, 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 the unique selling point, I mean, the majority of graduates going out into the world of employment have English. English has been described as like having a passport. It's like one of those things that you know, the majority of people have. The fact that you have Russian or Uzbek or access to a, a, a rich repertoire is a great strength of a graduate from an institution in this region. What about the languages people actually use day to day? This is quite odd. It shows the, um, the kind of um, odd nature of responses to questionnaires. Only 95% of students and staff uh, said that they used English, which is kind of impossible because they're engaged in, um, in a classroom environment which is, you know, predominantly English, that's a bit weird. Um, but the striking finding here is that Russian is by a long way the most widely used language across campus. And certainly when we get to administrative staff and maintenance staff, um, they are predominantly um, operating through the medium of, of, of Russian, which is you know, a, a major feature of this language environment. In answer to the question, should all communication be um, in English? Um, there is a strong ex expectation among students that um, there should be um, a kind of full immersion environment, um, but, um, but only um, when uh, you know, we kind of ask the question explicitly do we find the reality that only around 63% of students, you know, when, when really questioned, anonymously uh, think that it should all be about English, even though uh, when you're talking to students you find that there's that kind of desire, that formal desire to be immersed in English. Uh, and the same is true um, um, of the numbers of teachers. There's a mistake there. I think 24.4% of teachers agree that all communications should be uh, in English rather than 2.4%. So we need to check our data a bit there. Um, how positive are colleagues to linguistic diversity? Um, well, actually, all categories are supportive, and that's something that I think institutions need to be aware of, that you know, while you know, English medium might be uh, the thing, actually, when asked uh, academic Teachers and students um, are, you know, they're, they're people who are interested in languages. They, 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 they're very keen to learn more languages. Um, and colleagues at Westminster here were keen to be able to learn, you know, if there were more resources to help them gain language skills, they were keen for, for German and French and, um, and other languages um, beyond, beyond English. How well does your proficiency in English meet your, meet your needs? Um, well, um, the easy expectation that, 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 that teachers can simply travel around, travel around the world and, and function through English um, isn't completely borne out there. Um, we have about 90% of teaching staff saying that their English suits them well or very well, but 8% you know, of, of them express an anxiety that their English skills are, are only acceptable for the, the task that they, that they are set. And when we get to support staff, um, we find that um, you know, there, there is a kind of a, quite a strong sense of not being properly equipped. 20% of administrative staff think that their English skills are, are, um, are um, only acceptable um, or, or less. Here's an interesting question um, about um, the extent to which um, students are able to express themselves around their academic discipline. We see that um, a significant number, about 25%, say that they're more able to express themselves in Uzbek or Russian than English, and that must be seen as an important resource. And if students are, are going to be acquiring um, subject specific skills, we need to have a strong sense of um, the way in which they're best able, feel most comfortable uh, to uh, express their academic opinions. Um, if you were offered additional professional support in English, how likely would you be to sign up? Across the board, there is a huge appetite for, for more support. What that is or where it comes from is a, is a, a question, um, but you know, we need to be aware that, um, that those involved in these kind of environments really need to feel they're being well supported. 
final bit of data um, for now, um, which is uh, quite striking. Um, this was in response to the question to students, um, how good they think the English of their teachers is, and um, over 100 students thought that their teacher's English was acceptable or less, acceptable, poor, or very poor, and that has an impact on the confidence that students have in their teachers and, and needs to be uh, taken, taken seriously. Okay, so many of our findings um, then um, were very much in line with um, what um, Ernesto Macro and his colleagues um, found in the literature um, in terms of some of the kind of negative insights into um, um, the, the views of teachers and students across the world, deep concerns, lecturers concerned about their students' ability to thrive, um, ill-equipped to benefit from uh, their programmes, um, lecturers recognising that they had linguistic problems um, uh, and um, you know, very importantly nearly all studies alluding to the extra work involved and the generally laborious nature of English medium instruction. I'm just going to mention quickly um, two um, quite interesting um, and striking insights from our, our work here in Uzbekistan which uh, um, give perhaps a slightly different um, take on the experience uh, that than, um, the literature internationally um, has done. First of all, um, students um, in, in the um, institution that we've been looking at, but also in state institutions here and in the region, being embarrassed about using English, having a sense that using English outside the classroom is kind of weird. So English is a classroom thing. Using it um, elsewhere is kind of showing off, is kind of nerdy, is boasting, is embarrassing. So I think there's work to be done I mean, in, in the Nordic countries countries using English in society as a whole, absolutely kind of normal day-to-day -day activity. In Central Asia, English is a, is a kind of a classroom thing. Um, it needs to be uh, perhaps supported in different ways to allow people to feel that it's part of their normal kind of cultural linguistic, linguistic repertoire. And then the kind of final um, substantive point um, is very striking in the Nordic countries where we've done a lot of work into um, English uh, um, medium universities. Um, there's a, a very strong aversion to implementing the policies through any kind of punishment or control measures. Um, language is something actually that you, you may have a policy about it, but whoa, let's not, let's not interfere. Let's not try to, to kind of force it through or, 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 or expect that the policy be adopted. In this part of the world, actually, students did talk quite a lot about um, staff being punished or being controlled for not using English. And in that word cloud, you can see some interesting words emerging. Um, cameras, that maybe cameras should be uh, brought in to spot staff who are failing to use English uh, when they should. And decrease of salary, maybe, maybe people should have their, their income uh, docked if they fail to use English according to the policy. Um, I'm not going to say too much more about this because I'm, I'm nearly out of, out of time, um, but I would just note that, uh, that that final stage of policy implementation, the monitoring and control, is the really crucial bit. I've been working with colleagues who are developing language policies for international business, and for them it's very normal to have a performance and control stage uh, because you know, if you pay people to work in your company, they have to do certain things. They have to live by business ethics. They have to increase uh, productivity. And if there's a policy on language, then people just have to get on and use it. But that's much more problematic in higher education. Although it shouldn't be, because if teachers are being employed to work in that institution and there's a policy on language, like there's a policy on assessment and feedback, then you know, maybe they should get on um, and, and use it. Even in uh, the Nordic countries, um, where, as I'm going to be talking about in the next session, there's a long tradition of language policy making, um, a recent review has found that actually it's pretty hard, despite good beginnings in terms of language policy implementation, little has since been done, colleagues in Norway found, to implement, uh, to translate the goals into concrete practice. Um, um, policies tend to be sporadically implemented um, and so on. So that's something really to think about. I've got one minute left, so I'm, I'm into that minute now. Um, 
um, you know, be aware that, that having a you know, look at the UK, look at the mess we're in in the UK. Um, you know, leaving Europe might have seemed to some to be a good idea, but look how nightmarishly difficult actually making that um, happen um, is proving. I won't say any more about that uh, for now. So, we proposed 22 policy principles um, to our colleagues. Um, I'm happy to talk to um, individuals about those. Um, based on a number of, um, of, of principles um, there, um, they were um, across the whole area. This wasn't just about teaching and learning. Um, we need to understand um, what we're seeking to do in terms of research and other forms of, of communication. Um, and our final question then is, will our policy proposals make a difference. Um, Ernesto Macro and indeed the godfather of language policy, Bernard Spolsky, are pretty negative. Um, they believe that actually managers, um, uh, those who implement policies um, in universities and elsewhere, um, are on the whole not really interested in the findings of research. Um, and um, uh, so it'll be interesting to see what happens here. I'm not going to say what Westminster University in Tashkent has done with our proposals. Um, if you are interested to find out, then you can go and visit Westminster tomorrow, and one of my colleagues will, will talk a bit about, about what's been happening and whether, um, what, what, you know, what the implementation phase is, uh, is looking like. Why does it matter? Um, universities apply um, research. Um, you know, if we have insights, then universities as academic institutions should, should do something with that and not ignore it, I would say. Um, and there are key, uh, really key things that grow from this. The, uh, the, the well-being and the mental health of, st of staff and students is very much wrapped up in how they're forced to behave, their own confidence in themselves and in those around them. But on a more positive note, um, just doing more English fails to allow us to really celebrate the richness we have in our institutions as multilingual uh, ecologies, um, and we should really kind of capitalise on that in all sorts of, of ways. So there we go. That's uh, that's me done for now. Many thanks for your attention. Um, that's where I'm going to finish. Thank you.